New York, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering Spark Summit East. Brought to you by Spark Summit. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Welcome to New York City, everybody. This is the Cube, and I'm here with. George Gilbert, this is Dave Vellante. We're here, this is our second big data show this year, and it just so happens it's, it's in New York. We had the Rapid Miner show, George, earlier this year, and of course we're here at Spark Summit East. This is the second Cube day that we've done at, uh, at Spark Summit. We did uh, the West Coast in San Francisco earlier this year. We didn't, we didn't do the European show in Amsterdam, but the growth of the Spark community is, is quite impressive. Uh, we saw some numbers earlier today. We were here last night to, at the meetup there were close to three, four hundred people last night geeking out hardcore data scientists. You know, George, you were pointing out in our prep calls earlier this week that the East Coast community is much more substantially what we call the doers, the practitioners that are actually applying big data, you know, versus the West Coast, you get a lot more of the technologist community, the vendor community, a lot of doers as well, but many, many more doers here, primarily because of the financial services industry, um, so Spark is really beginning to, to take the world by storm. We heard a lot last night about Spark 1.0 and of course 1.6 and Tungsten and how that was sort of dealing with bringing Spark closer to the bare metal. And now it, it, it really in Spark 2.0, it's about optimizations, code optimizations, improved streaming. And we're going to talk about all that. You know, heavy, heavy geekdom going on here. It reminds me of the early days of, of Hadoop world. And of course, one of the things we want to really explore today on theCUBE is what's the business impact of all this stuff? We saw this in the early days of Hadoop, George, where you know, a lot of the discussion early on was about you know, bringing you know, the code to the data, and not the data to the code, and how to, how to deal with things like you know, the complexities of MapReduce, and all these projects like Scoop, and Flume, and Hive, and Pig, and all these other sort of acronyms that we really didn't understand at the time, and have sort of learned as the ecosystem grows, you're hearing a lot of the sort of similar uh, discussions at really detailed level, granular technology levels at, at Spark. You know, we, and we want to explore that, but we also really want to look at the business impact. So, you know, we heard this morning uh, from Andy Konwinski, who's the, one of the co-founders of Databricks, uh, and also in responsible for the, the, tr the training, the online training, uh, but Matei uh, Zaharia, who's the creator of Spark, he came out and he really <laughs> gave a meaty, meaty presentation. I think you heard uh, 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 a lot of that. And then, of course, Ali Gosi, both of those individuals are coming on uh, the Cube later. He was the co-founder and CEO of Databricks, really talking about why Databricks is founded, which gets me to you know, the bottom line here. Databricks was founded to simplify big data. They created a um, uh, 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 Spark gave it to the Apache community, you know, open sourced it to the Apache community, and it's really beginning to take off, you know, since. George, you've been doing a lot of work in this area. Uh, you're just about to release the industry's first ever Spark forecast in the context of our overall big data forecast. So, you kind of helped us get into this business, right? You were high on Databricks, what they were doing, the whole, you know, notion of, of, of the importance of in-memory and, and, and eventually real time. So, what's your take on what's happening uh, in, in the world of big data generally, and specifically, Spark's impact. Okay, so, um, well it's great te teeing it up. The, the, what we're really say, seeing, like what you saw with Hadoop, any enterprise software has to go through this phase where it's teething, and that's where you sort of work out the kinks. When you're trying to get into production, you hit these sort of, I wouldn't call them roadblocks, but you, you, you have to, um, get w work around to them, and then the vendors have to sort of make stuff uh, production ready. So those were you were you were naming some of the the situations that, that you would find yourself in with Hadoop, and we're we're sort of in that phase with Spark, um, where uh, where you heard about the talk about Project Tungsten, which is to try and get to bare metal performance. That's where um, we want to get the um, ease of use of Spark with the performance of uh, you know, software that's written all the way down to the metal. Um, but more importantly, Spark came about um, as a reaction to and as a replacement for MapReduce, um, which is the core processing um, engine of, of Hadoop. And 
the idea was to take better advantage of memory to build something that's higher level and more usable. Um, and now um, it's also integrated more capabilities. So you can use it as if it were a SQL um, query engine. You can use it for machine learning. You can use it for graph processing, which is helpful for things like recommendation engines. Um, by putting all those things together, um, you've really got what is an engine for the next five plus years of big data applications. Let me just qualify that and say that where Hadoop got us, if, if we look at systems of intelligence as a, as a journey, and we have three stages in that, we have the data lake, which is better, faster, cheaper sort of data warehouse, plus some things, minus some things. Stage two is sort of personalized um, digital experiences for a consumer dealing with a, a vendor. And the third phase is uh, real time, uh, deep in integration with systems of record for things like uh, fraud detection or, or even Internet of Things. Hadoop got us through phase one. Okay, so so let's let's talk about that a little bit. So okay. so the epiphany of Hadoop back in the you know 2008 2009 timeframe was you can bring, as I said earlier, you can bring you know five me megabytes of code to a petabyte of data, distribute you know leave the data where it is, distribute the code, act on it you know accordingly, map it and, and reduce it so so to speak, um, and and that began particularly in the financial services industry we saw. A lot of folks, a lot of the big banks and, and, and other you know, industries for sure, starting to build out data pipelines, <clears throat> what our friend Abhi Mehta called at the time the data factory. And one of the points he made at the time was sampling is dead. You know, no longer do we need to do sampling. And the reason was the, that Hadoop dramatically lowered the cost of the, the, the dreaded storage container. Right. right? In fact, Jeff Hammerbacher said in the early days of Hadoop, one of his, his primary missions when he was at Facebook was to uh, obliterate the expensive storage container, sort of a shot at the you know, traditional right. you know, EMC, NetApp sort of boxes, you know, because they're too expensive. And that's why you had to sample data. Now with Hadoop dramatically lowering the cost of storing data, you could actually you know, operate on all that data. So we started to build data lakes. And essentially, you've pointed out, it was a cheaper version of, of, of the data warehouse. The, ret the return on investment in the early days of Hadoop was was actually reduction on investment, lowering the denominator. Yes. Okay, so now, and, and Hadoop, of course, everybody knows, largely batch, and there have been some projects that try to deal with that. Now, enter Spark. So, you've just gone out, George, you've done you know, probably the most comprehensive study of the big data you know, business uh, certainly ever done. Uh, you've talked, I don't know, how many, how many companies in um, the last month? At least two 40. Months? So, 40 companies in the last, in the last month or so, yeah. last couple of months. Uh, and a number of practitioners, uh, doers as we call them, and obviously a number of technologists. And you touched on these in your earlier remarks, but let's explore them in a little bit more detail. What are the key takeaways that you, that you want the, our community to understand in terms of your findings? Okay, so, so it's pretty simple. And I started touching on these, um, that there are three stages in the customer journey. That's the first and most important way for um, both vendors and doers to understand what they're going how they're going to apply the technology. So the data lake, um, we we could do that with um, classic Hadoop. We can do some elements of it better with um, with with Spark. But then the second stage after that, as I was saying, are these uh, sort of more real time personalized systems. And the the third stage is where we've got um, essentially autonomous software, where um, it can uh, accept or reject a credit application or a credit card um, or uh, take action on, on uh, Internet of Things without a human in the loop. That's the key thing. So that needs to be near real time. Um, so the first takeaway then is those are the stages in the customer journey. Um, the second... Um, so just to clarify yeah. that, so, so Spark essentially you're saying is, 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 is is, is taking the baton yes. from yes. the traditional Hadoop on the data warehouse, yes. the data lake. Yes. Because the data lake is kind of a mess. Uh, Hadoop is very fragmented and complicated. So uh, the, the founders of Databricks, they started the company to simplify big data. 
right? So yes, right? Is that and is that right? That's so a, it's an excellent analogy. It's not that Hadoop can't do scenario two, which is the personalized um, sort of digital experiences. It's just that it's hard. It's hard on the administrators. It's hard on the developers, and it's hard to get it to be um, in real enough time. So. Spark, when you get the kinks worked out, can help a lot there. And when we get to the real, real-time stuff in, in scenario three, the Hadoop as it's currently constituted can't really you Okay, know, so you're talking about sort of, sort of three main findings. One is that the, the data lake is, and the Hadoop data lake are evolving right. and becoming simplified around, around uh, a Spark. And now there's two vectors there as well, those who have big Hadoop investments and a lot of skills. Yes basically evolving their data lakes to accommodate or bring in Spark to simplify things, speed things up, et cetera, uh, and, and those that are basically starting from scratch, you know, without Hadoop, uh, yes. because it's, and, it's simpler. Okay. And that makes a difference in terms of what type of uh, technology commitments they'll make. Okay, and then, and then there's all, so, all kinds of, you know, detail vectors right. we can go down there. Right. The second is personalized real-time but services. These are all, and these are all in the, in the category of the first set of learnings. The, the three takeaways. The first is this journey, which you're articulating. And, and as you're saying, it's a handoff, you know, that's gradual from the data lake to the real-time ser personalized services to the sort of autonomous IoT type applications. As you need deeper and deeper integration with systems of record and um, faster uh, response, you move more and more away from classic Hadoop towards Spark-like systems. Okay, and so that's that's so, takeaway okay, number one. So, so the, okay, but the, that then that, that okay. Well, go ahead. What's takeaway number two? Okay, so takeaway number two is the real big surprise, as far as I was concerned, um, and even uh, I guess institutionally, as we were concerned, because last year we said in the study that there's no way this whole market can take off without applications, because if you can't make this stuff repeatable, then you'll have armies of consultants. Um, picture every time you want to do a fraud detection or prevention app or recommendation engine, picture having to do 85% of it from scratch. That's just not going to scale. So last year we made an assumption that the only way it'll work is if we will have apps to scale. We did a huge amount of research and we came away with, with a conclusion that we've seen very little of in terms of people sharing it, which is, we're not going to have packaged apps anytime soon. It's just there are too many things that are unknown and unsolved. So that means we're going to do handcrafted solutions for several years out. And that means slower growth for the overall market. And it also means that we're not going to see the rise of the big, you know, big new class of ISVs. So heavy, heavy, heavy customization. Mike Olson five years ago said this 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 will be the year of the app. Yes. It never it and never transpired like, because of the complexity. Right. That's what you're saying. And okay. And then the third yeah. uh, tent pole takeaway is really around you know real time. Right. Right. So talk about that a little bit. Okay. So um, if if we look at a vector, um, well, that's that's a techie term. If we look at the changes that are, we're going through in those customer use cases in the journey, we're getting tighter and tighter integration with the systems of record, the core backend apps, like your order processing, uh, inventory control, anything that is controlling and uh, uh, access to your resources. And in the second, in the, in the second journey, you've got the apps that are at the edge that are supporting your digital experience, the tighter that coupling gets, the more you need something like Spark so that you can make a claim on resources. You can get a real-time price. You can say, do we have resources, whether it's an airline seat or a widget to offer, or which widget should we upsell? Um, so it's tighter integration and faster response, and that's, that's where we need Spark-like systems to take us. Okay, okay good. And we're going to we're going to unpack this okay. throughout the day today. Uh, George later on today will be presenting uh, our view, uh, Wikibon's view of the big data space generally, and then specifically Spark in context. Uh, so keep it right there. We got a number of guests coming up today. This is the cube. We're live from Spark Summit East in Manhattan. We'll be right back. <laughs>